uh, John chapter 17, verses 19 through 22. Allow me just a couple of more passages of Scripture here today. It says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, this is Jesus speaking, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. He says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Amen. Praise God. If you allow me just for a few brief moments today, I want to preach on a simple topic, defenders of his glory. Amen. How many know that we are defenders of his glory? Amen. Praise God. And I pray, Lord, today, God, that your glory would continue to shine through us, that, that your glory would continue to shine through this church. And I pray, God, that we recognize our responsibility as receiving your spirit, as receiving your glory, the responsibilities that are given upon us that we should Amen. We should protect that glory. We should, we should uh, 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 covet that glory. We should uh, appreciate that, that glory, Lord, and even stand up, amen, to protect that glory in our lives and in our hearts. God, we love you. We praise you. I pray, God, that you anoint me, God, to preach the word of the Lord today. Help me, God, to speak what thus saith the Lord. I pray, God, today in the name of Jesus Christ. And amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Well, I don't mind telling you that if God were not alive today, I, I, I wouldn't be too interested in studying the Bible. If I never felt God, it would be hard to convince me that, that God is real. Uh, if God did not choose to move today, I, I would not spend the hours that I do in church and, and in prayer and, and in study and certainly would not be doing what I do today in ministry. You see, I can go through my trials and I can have a lot of heartaches in this life and you can disillusion me with, with many things, but there is one thing which I am completely convinced of here in this house today, and that is that God is a very real God. I believe that God still moves today. I believe that God is still very interested in me and in you and in what's going on in this service this morning. And I also believe that God is very interested in our response to Him. Amen. That's why we preach on praise and worship. That's why we preach on prayer. Amen. And getting to know God for yourself. Because I believe that God is still interested in what His people do to serve Him and to live for Him and to uh, uh, give themselves to Him each and every day. Somebody say amen anyway. Hallelujah. Praise God. That, that's why there is nothing in this life that I love more than just plain and simply being in the wonderful presence of God. The memories that I personally cherish the most is the times when the wonderful glory of God has filled the building or has filled my heart in my life and without a shadow of a doubt, that moment when you know that God is in, the play, in this place. Whenever you have those experiences, those monumental uh, moments in your life where you know that, oh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God is working on your behalf, that God is answering your prayer, that God is coming through right on time, that God is making that way when there seems to be no way possible. Isn't that such a, a great experience in your life to know whenever God begins to answer those prayers and, and God begins to move in your life and, God, and you see the hand of the Lord begin to work in your situations? Oh, hallelujah. Or you experience experience the glory and the presence of God in your life. Many, I know I can't see him with my physical eyes, and, and, and I, if I can just be honest, uh, I, I can't figure him out most of the time in my life, but, but I can sure tell whenever he begins to visit his people. Amen, because they begin to, they begin to uh, 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 act different. They begin, maybe you see God begin to move and, and tears begin to flow up in their eyes or, or they begin to lift up their hands and cry out and to praise the Lord or, or, or they begin to do things otherwise that were not normally normal. Amen, whenever they're touched and affected by the presence of God. 
It's even to the place where, where it changes them forever. Where old things pass away. And all things become new. You see, whenever, whenever you come into contact with God, you will, you will never be the same again. Because God is, He is a God of change. Amen. God never changes. Uh, a lot of things change in our lives uh, from each and every day. But God, God, whenever you come into contact with God, you will never be the same again. And I'm not going to preach upon that, but I'm talking about uh, the, the God's glory. But uh, uh, it's a, a good heaven. You know, let me say it like this. And if it's so good about experiencing and feeling the presence of God down here, I wonder what it's going to be like whenever we make it to heaven. I just wonder whenever there's no flesh. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody can shout on that. Whenever your back doesn't hurt and your knees don't hurt, you don't have a crickety shoulder and, you, and, and things aren't going on, and you can just worship the Lord to the freeness uh, of your... Uh, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and there's no hindrance. There's nothing holding you back. Amen. You can just praise and worship God as long as you... Oh, hallelujah. I wonder what that's going to be like whenever we make it to heaven and we can begin to jump up and down and run on the streets of gold and begin to... Have a, 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 a glory party yes. in the middle of his presence. Yes. That's right. Just <laughs> saturate, yes. saturated in the glory, consumed by his presence and able to worship him unrestrained. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, the word glory is, is the word doxa, and it means the extravagant, magnificent splendor and brightness of a pure king. It referred to the times that God's mighty splendor and magnificent power came among men till there was no doubt that the king of glory had visited that place. Ha, I'm talking about the glory of God. You know, the word doxa denotes all of the goodness and it also denotes all of the power and all of the ability that's in the king as well. You see, when the glory of God comes into a place, what is happening? It's not just a feeling, but what is happening is that God has made everything that we need available to you for that moment. All His power, all of His glory is at your expense. Amen. All the riches, all the power, and all the miracles, all the blessings that you need in that moment is available. That's why I say every service, I just pray that God's glory would fall in this house, that God's presence would just begin to move. And, and, and as we lift him up and praise God, and, and, and we know that as the praises go up, the, the blessings and his presence comes down. And as his spirit and glory begins to move, amen, you have at your disposal the, all the greatness and the power of your king. Amen. If there's one objective that I have as a preacher... If there's one purpose that we have this morning as a church, if there's one goal that we should all aspire to here this morning, that should be to do whatever we can for the glory of the Lord to fill this place. Sometimes I got to push aside my fears. I got to push aside my doubts. I got to push aside what I've got to do tomorrow, all my distractions i got to break past, you see, the veil of the flesh. It doesn't matter what else happens. It doesn't matter who else comes through these doors today or what might be going on around me or even where I'm going after service here today. I've got to feel His glory. I've got to feel the presence of God. I've got to feel the Holy Ghost moving in my life. I've got to prepare myself and, and involve myself and do whatever needs to be done in my life for His glory to feel this place. Why? Because that's where his power is manifested. That's where his strength is going to be shown. That's where faith begins to operate and where fear begins to flee when his glory begins to enter this place. You know, if you read through your Bible, you'll find that the glory of God is referred to many times throughout the Bible. God chose a particular people, the Israelites, to use to, use to reveal His glory to the whole world. You see, when, when Jacob was running from his past and not quite sure what he was going to do with his life, it was the glory of God that met him at Bethel. 
And 14 years later, the glory of God met him once again. And when the glory of God met with a man who would humble himself in repentance, God was able to forever change Jacob's life. Jacob the deceiver became Israel the keeper of God's glory simply because of some encounters in his presence. And as human beings today, we must never underestimate the power that's held within God's glory. I don't care how many times that you failed God. I don't care how many times that you've fallen in your relationship with God. Can I just say this? Keep going to church. Keep, I, I don't care how hard it may seem or, or how deep the sin is that you're in. Keep coming to church. It may be one of those times, because why do I see just keep coming to church? Because it may be just one of those services where God's glory can move in your life and overcome the, the, the situations and the temptations and the trials that befall you in your life. Keep inviting folks to church. It doesn't matter what you've done. Maybe if you've done it a hundred times before, it doesn't matter if they're entangled from sin. It doesn't matter what's, what may be going on in their lives, but let them experience the wonderful glory of God. It still has the power to change. It still has the power to heal. It still has the power to deliver. Amen. Amen. Bree shared with me, I hope you don't mind me sharing this story, Bree. She says she works six days a week. One day of rest, but, but what does she do on her day of rest? She wants to get into God's glory. Because that's where her strength is. That's where, that's where she's going to find, amen, how to make it through these next six days. Amen. It's, in, it's all found in the glory of God. It's all found in getting into His presence. And I don't know about you, but, but every opportunity I have, I, I know i got to get God's glory. I know i got to get in contact with God's glory. I know i got to touch Him. Amen. And allow Him to touch me. Amen. And allow His Spirit to refill me, renew me, refresh me in my life. Amen. It was Israel that God called out to be separate. And the reason was that God wanted to reveal to them His glory. While the pagan religions dealt in fable and fiction, the one and true and living God of Israel, He revealed Himself as a living God who was able and who was magnificent. Can you just imagine the feeling of seeing the glory of God descend like a cloud upon the temple? And knowing that God Almighty had just come in with all of His power and with all of His might that His presence is so thick that can visibly be seen. Can you imagine being at Solomon's temple after Solomon had, had just spent great effort and great expense in preparing a place for God to begin to dwell and seeing the sacrifices get interrupted by the glory cloud of God that was so thick that the Bible says the priest could not even stand to minister. The planned dedication service was it was interrupted, you see, by, by the glory of Almighty God descending and moving upon that place. So hallelujah. I pray that God would just sometimes interrupt our service. I pray that God sometimes just step in and, and interrupt our lives a little bit and, and begin to show His glory and begin to touch and move and work inside of our lives and hearts. Amen. What, what a powerful move. What, what a powerful God. What, what a blessed people they were to have the glory of God in their lives. Can I say, we too are so blessed. The same things that attracted God to move in such a powerful way has attracted God to move in our church as well, in this city as well. You see, there are three things that attracted God to move in Solomon's temple. Number one, the people had gathered themselves together to commit themselves to praise and to worship only the one true living God with a humble and with a repentant heart. And number two, we know that the temple was also furnished and built according to God's design, according to God's specifications. And number three, we know that there was much sacrifice. There's much sacrifice of time and of animals and effort to prepare a place for God to dwell amongst His people. And all three have attracted God unto us 
this day as well. You see, that this morning is a tremendous example of the mighty glory of God being able to visit us. Sometimes He descends in worship. Sometimes we know God the sins in the preaching. And sometimes we know that God the sins in the altar call after, after the, uh, the, the preaching is over. But there have been many times when, when God has come with, with all of His glory in the, and maybe in the prayer meeting uh, before service as well. Why? Because some of us are meeting the same criteria that attracted God to Solomon's temple. Amen. You see, God's glory will come through your praise, through your sincere, heartfelt worship, always with a humble and a repentant heart. Just, and just as a temple was furnished, and the, we know the temple was built according to God's design and, and God's specifications, you see, it takes studying and knowing the Word of God to make our bodies a, a temple that's designed according to God's specifications. Oh, hallelujah. You see, when we're following God's word, when we're following God's specifications, we will begin to see his glory to begin to move and operate inside of each and every one of our lives. In other words, we need to repent of our sins and we got to be buried with him in his name. That happens when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. No other name will do, for there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And we got to be filled today with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. we got to be filled with the Spirit. we got to be born again of water and of the Spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. We have to, uh, we have, to have received uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence uh, of speaking in other tongues. For the promise is unto you uh, and it's unto your children and all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And just as there was a sacrifice of time and of animals and of effort to prepare a place for God to dwell, God's glory still moves today as we prepare our hearts through prayer, through meditation of His Word, through the time and the sacrifice that we give to prepare ourselves to be a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto Him. Romans 12 and 1 says, let me read it for you. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You see, God still wants to dwell today in this hour amongst His people. He still wants to reveal His glory to His chosen people. He still wants to reveal His glory to this area, to Warrington, Virginia, by people who are committed to worship Him and to give Him their pure and their humble hearts over unto the Lord by people who are willing to sacrifice their time, sacrifice their, their worship, sacrifice their effort and expense to provide a place for God to dwell and meet His people within. And by people People who are willing to build the temple of the Holy Ghost inside of their bodies in the design and to His specifications. When people are going that direction in their lives, God will reveal His precious glory unto the people. You see, in our text, it was the night before Jesus' death, and Jesus was praying for His disciples. And as he prayed for them, he looked at the 11 and realized that there were, they were just a, but a small part of what God wanted to do. You know, God, Jesus started a home missions work. He only had a, we got a, just almost about as much of a congregation that Jesus had. He, he only had about 11 or so disciples. But uh, they were all his disciples and they all had spent about three and a half years with Jesus literally walking the earth. And I, as I recently read Jesus' prayer, something stood out to me. It's in John 17 and 19. He says, and I, I read it as our main text as well, but it says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Here's what I noticed. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. For they all may be one. And I hope somebody caught that. You see, Jesus just wasn't praying for 11 disciples. 
Jesus wasn't just playing, praying for 11 Jewish men who were there, but he was praying for, quote, them also which shall believe on me through their word. In other words, he wasn't praying just for the original apostles. But he was praying for all who would believe on Jesus through the disciples' word. Amen. Then Jesus went on to say that they, meaning the apostles and those who would believe their word concerning Jesus, that they all may be one. So what does that mean? It, it explains it in verse 22. It says, and, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus was praying that the glory of God would be manifest through the disciples and that same glory that had been revealed to Israel would carry on throughout His disciples and even into those who believe on Jesus through the disciples' words. That means us. That means you. That means me. That means the glory of God can dwell in this church today. That means the glory of the... Oh, hallelujah. That means the glory of the Holy Ghost can dwell in our homes. That means the glory of God can dwell in our schools. That means the glory of God can dwell wherever God's people are. Oh, hallelujah. Do you realize, amen, you can take the glory of God with you wherever you go? Oh, hallelujah. And, and, and where the glory of the Lord is, unboundless possibilities. Amen. God has all power in heaven and earth. God is able to do above and beyond exceedingly whatever we could ask or think. Praise God. In other words, God, God, God didn't give us a bunch of stories about His glory descending and miracles and powers and wonders being done just to make us sigh and wish that we could have that. That's not why the, the Old Testament stories are there for us just to be wish that we could experience those moments. But He gave them to each of us to reveal to us exactly what He wants to do through each and every one of us here this morning. You see, Jesus prayed that the glory of God would be revealed through the apostles and those who believed on Him through their word. That's why when you begin to teach and you begin to obey the apostles' doctrine, it begins to bring the glory of God in your life when you begin to teach and to preach the same message that was preached as Peter and John and what Paul preached and begin to obey it and practice it and live it in your life you begin to experience the glory of the Lord many of you through either teaching or divine revelation have come to realize that the truth of who Jesus Christ is you started to realize the importance of repentance and water baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You begin to believe on Jesus from the apostles' words. And you know exactly what Paul was talking about when he asked the guys in Ephesus, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And as you begin to change your beliefs and actions to match the apostles' doctrine, you become the benefactor of His glory. You become the benefactor of his truth and God will make his glory manifested in your life in a special way both in your life and in the church that preaches the truth the glory of God should be a common occurrence in our services we should see God move in his glory fall every time we gather together seeing and experience the glory of God should be the normal for this church service Amen. I, I long for a day, amen, where we can just uh, uh, go to God and feel His glory and get lost in His presence together and begin to experience His power together and to see signs and miracles and wonders begin to be made manifest. Because why? Because we are gathered together as one and we begin to call upon the name of the Lord and we begin to see His glory begin to move and fall in the midst of, of this place, amen, and we, re, and we start to see the miracles of God manifesting. It all happens when the glory of God comes down. Folks, I don't want a service to go by where we don't experience His glory. You know what? Can I just be transparent and honest? We're not here just for a fellowship. We're not here as a, a, a gathering. This isn't a club. Amen. If, if, if we were just to gather together and, and just go through the motions and not experience the glory, I would go to another church across town. 
Amen. But, but, I, but this is a place where I want God. This is what separates us. Experiencing and feeling the power and the glory of God. I don't want to just be a, have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. But I want His glory to move each and every service. That's why, that's why pre-service prayer is so important because I want our hearts and our lives to be so prepared and ready. So whenever the worship comes, oh, I know, we, we, sometimes we trip and we muddle our voice through it. But, but I want His glory to fall and His Spirit to move, amen. Despite, despite how, how things uh, uh, may sound, amen, I, I want God to, His glory to move and to touch. And it's the worship of the people. Amen. Anyhow. In our other text, we know that Paul stated that the law was glorious, but was intended to die. In other words, the law was written with one thing in mind, Jesus Christ dying to end it. Amen. And, the, and yet the law was glorious. The 2 Corinthians 3 and 7 says, But in the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious. That's the law written in stone, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. That was glorious, but that's to be done away. Verse 8 says, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that, ex that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. So what's his point? What's he trying to say? If the law was so glorious that when Moses came down from receiving it, the glory of the Lord shone so much that Moses had to put a veil over his face because it scared the people half to death. The glory of God had so great effect on Moses who witnessed it that the people saw a visible appearing, a visible shining. But Paul went on to say that the law was simply to bring us to Jesus Christ and to the dispensation of grace. The law was to get us to a time when the Spirit of God could minister among us. So if the law was that glorious, and the glory of God in law was able to have such a tremendous effect, then the glory of God now, today, that the Spirit of God has been poured out now, now that Jesus Christ has died, now that Jesus Christ has risen again, it will exceed in glory. Can I put it like this? The latter rain shall be greater than the former rain. You see, it's His presence. It's His glory. And His Spirit will be made manifest for all to receive today. When I think of what God has done for the people of Israel, when I think about the glory of God coming and troubling the Egyptians while Israel escaped on the other side of the Red Sea. When I think of how the glory of God led Israel literally into the promised land. When I think of how the glory of God filled the temple and shook the mountains and, and all the wonderful acts that God did for His people back then. I need to realize that God is going to do greater things for His people in this hour, in this age today. For the people who believe this precious this apostolic message for those who are willing to build this temple according to the specifications of God's word I believe we're going to see greater works and greater revivals and greater miracles and greater things for God to do when his glory is manifested amongst his people in our text when God brought the children of Israel he brought them to Mount Sinai and he showed them his glory Exodus 19 and 19 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, and the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. God then gave them stipulations on how to guard the glory as well. As I began to read this passage this week, something stood out to me that I, I never quite noticed before. What would happen to the people? If they touched the mountain. Bible says, scripture says that they would be killed. But how would they be killed? Scripture leads to say that God left it up to the people to execute judgment to those who touched the mountain. Amen. 
In other words, God was going to reveal His glory, and yet it was up to, it was up to the people to defend it. Let me read it. Exodus 19, verse 10. There's, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Verse 12 says, And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take of it, excuse me, take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. Verse 13, There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely, what? He shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. You see, in all Scripture, I can only think of a few times that God has defended His glory Himself. Think of men like Uzzah. Everybody know the story of Uzzah. God struck a man named Uzzah dead because he touched the Ark of Covenant while they were moving it. Another time I can think of, God burned up the sons of Aaron. Nadab and Abihu, when they had offered up strange fire to God upon the altar. Another time I can think of is when God struck dead Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Ghost. But since then, we cannot find another person struck by God in defense of His glory. Why? Because God has left it up to us now to defend His glory. If you want the glory of God to stay... And I want the glory of God to stay in this church. If you want the glory of God to stay, then you must be willing to defend it. Amen. Why would God strike Uzzah dead? And yet, when the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant, which is where God dwelt, God didn't strike the Philistines down. He didn't kill them immediately, did He? Because God wanted Israel. Because God wanted His promised people to defend his glory. God wanted the people to stand up and to serve God and, and to love Him and to keep His commandments in order to keep the glory. Amen. We've already talked about when Solomon dedicated the temple to God. In, in reading, I found another disturbing scripture. Let me read it. It's in 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all of Solomon's desire, which, was, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication, and thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built put my name there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually and if he says and if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and, and will keep my statutes and my judgments then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever as I promised to David thy father saying there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel verse 6 says and listen to this but if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, he said this, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. And this house which I have hallowed for his name uh, will I cast out of my sight. And Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among the people. And at this house, which is high, and every one that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss. And they shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? And they shall answer, and I have this underlined, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken a hold upon other gods. And they worshiped them, and they served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. In other words, God was saying this, it's up to you, Israel. It's up to you to defend my glory in the midst of, of, of this place. I'll help you begin to, uh, I'll help you unless you begin to serve other gods. And if that happens, then I'm going to leave this house and I'm going to leave this dwelling place. Solomon did eventually turn his back upon serving God. And when he did, the kingdom followed suit. 
Nebuchadnezzar came and burnt Jerusalem. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 36 and 7, it says, Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. 2 Kings 25 and 9 says, And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great man's house burnt he with fire. Ezra 1 and 7 says, Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods. You see, why am I reading this? Why am I talking about this? Because I've often, I've often wondered why a God that was so strict that if the priests were to enter into the temple, say, forgetting to wash himself, or maybe he forgot to change his garments, that God would strike him dead if he tried to enter into the holiest of holies. Yet when the armies of Nebuchadnezzar came in, a pagan, a pagan land, they walked right into the temple and touched and stole all those sacred vessels. They walked into the holiest place and they carried out the ark themselves. Why didn't God strike them dead? Do you know why? Because God was already gone. His glory was already departed. When the people chose to live in idolatry and compromise and to live like the world or live like other pagan lands, God said this, if you will not defend my glory, I'm going to leave. If you're not going to stand up for truth, for righteousness, I'm going to stand up and leave. It's up to us to keep this precious glory of God intact for this community, for this county. Love those sunglasses. For God. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand here today. We're going to stay until they got me off track. We're going to stand. We got a good picture of that. You see, when I when I look over the history of God's people, I can find generations that have neglected to defend the glory of God. Just as God was already gone when Nebuchadnezzar came, so was the glory of God departed from Solomon's temple when the Romans destroyed it in AD 70. Matthew 24, 1 through 2 says, And Jesus went out, and he departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? He said, Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. When they rejected the apostles' message, the glory of God had left the temple. Now, just because the Spirit of God lives in temples in the human body today doesn't lessen the responsibility of us to guard His glory right. in our hearts and our lives. Oh, hallelujah. We must become, if you will, guardians of the glory of God in our lives. It's not enough to feel the glory of God one time. It's not enough just to have one experience somewhere in our past where God may have touched us or, or we, we got goosebumps <laughs> Amen. or we felt the Lord in one moment. Or, no, we have got to feel God continually. In other words, we got to guard the glory. we got to guard the Holy Ghost that's inside of us, inside of our lives. See, can, I, can I say this? Every, in this crazy day and age, whenever you get on the Internet, Protect your glory. Protect the glory of God. Don't go wandering around. Don't go surfing at things we shouldn't be looking at. Whenever, whenever, sometimes even whenever we're watching the news or, or you're, you're looking, guard the glory of God in your life. Guard the glory of God in your heart. Yes, we still today, I, because our bodies are God's temple, we've got to guard that glory, the Holy Ghost inside of each. No flesh is going to glory in His presence. Every time 
We start to get angry at somebody. Can we, can we guard the glory? Every time we feel resentment or strife towards somebody that's wronged us in our past, can we guard the glory? Every time we, every time, even sometimes where it seems like we got justification for our wrongs and, and for justification to act the way we do, can I just say it like this? Guard the glory inside of you. Live like God wants you to live. Act like God wants you to act. Amen. And serve Him all of your life. Because I don't want to be in a place where, like Samson, where he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. Amen. I want God to be in my life each and every day. We need the glory of God, and we've got to keep it. We, got to, we need to protect it. We need to defend His glory in our lives, in our church. We need to protect His glory in our homes. We need to protect His glory in our families. We need to protect the glory of God. I'm looking at today the defenders of His glory. Amen. Why don't we lift up our hands and our hearts. Let's talk to the Lord here today. God, we love you, Jesus. God, I praise you, Lord God, and help me in my life. God, in everything that I do, God, whether I'm at work, God, or whether I'm at home, God, or whether I'm...